Section 4 of Bullet with His Name. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bullet with His Name by Fritz Leiber. Section 4 Ernie's sister didn't get food poisoning. She only got fat. But the incident of the chocolate cake was for Ernie the beginnings of a series of peculiar food revulsions and diet experiments that eventually made Ernie, instead of his sister, the family yogurt fiend and a regular customer of his old acquaintance, Herman, the health food manufacturer. Herman had to admit that Ernie had cooked himself up a pretty good longevity diet for an amateur, though there were some items in it that made the old man shake his head, and he always asserted that Ernie was passing up a good thing in soybean mush. Ernie got his diet tailored to fit his tastes and stuck to it. He had a strong suspicion of what had happened, though he tried not to think about it too often, that his gift of second sight had taken to warning him of the longer-range dangers to his existence. After all, chocolate cake can be as deadly as atomic bombs in the long run. More years passed. Friends and relatives began to remark quietly to each other that his sister was aging faster. Ernie, they had to admit, was a remarkably well-preserved old gent. Ironic, considering what a drunk he had been and what strange junk he had insisted on eating now. One day, Ernie's self-styled health diet began to pall on him. It didn't revolt him. It merely left him unsatisfied, yet with no yearning for any particular food he could think of. He lived with this yearning for some weeks, meditating on it and trying to guess its nature. Finally, he had an inspiration. He headed for Mr. Willis's drugstore. The bent, silvery-haired man greeted him eagerly. Somehow there was a special warmth about the friendships Ernie had made during the strange weeks, Verna and Vivian accepted, that put them in a different class from any other of his human relationships. Now what can I give you, Ernie? Mr. Willis asked. Anything in the place within reason. I'll tell you, Bert, I'd just like to go back in your dispensary, you with me if you want, and just shop around. That's sort of a screwy idea, Ernie. I couldn't sell you any narcotics or sleeping pills, of course. Well, maybe a few sleeping pills. I wouldn't want any. What's the idea, Ernie? Getting interested in chemistry in your old... You know, Ernie, you just don't look your years. Secret of mine. Yes, in a way, I've gotten interested in chemistry. Won't talk, eh? I remember when I first met you, I tagged you for an evening inventor. Well, come on back and shop around. Just don't ask me for elixir vitae or orum potabile or ground philosopher's stone. Not unless I see him. Afterward, Bert Willis used to say it was one of the most mystifying experiences of his life. For a good half a day, Ernie Meeker studied the rows of jars, canisters, and glass-stoppered bottles, sometimes lifting two down together and contemplating them, one in each hand, as if he could weigh the difference. Often he'd take out a stopper and sniff, and maybe, asking permission of Bert with a glance, take up a dab of some powder and taste it. You know that game, Bert would say, where someone goes out of the room and you all decide on an object or a hide one? and he comes back and tries to find it by telepathy or muscle reading or something? That was exactly the way Ernie was acting. Dog on a difficult scent. A couple of times, especially when the customers came in, Bert wanted to chase him out, except that Ernie was such a special friend, and Bert was so darn curious about it all himself. In the end, Ernie made a good twenty purchases, including a mortar and pestle, and two poisons for which Bert made him sign, though the amounts were less than a lethal dose. Actually, none of the chemicals he bought were very dangerous, Bert would say, and none of them were terribly unusual. The thing about them was that, put together, they just didn't make sense, as a medicine or anything else. Let me see. There was sulfur, bismuth, a pit of mercury, one of the sulfur drugs, a tiny packet of auric chloride, and I, ha I had them all in a list once, but I've lost it. After that, Ernie always mixed a little grayish paste in his cup of yogurt at supper time. Ernie stopped aging altogether. 
After his sister's coffin was lowered past the margins of green matting into the ground, Ernie shook hands with the minister, walked Bert Willis and Herman Scover to their car, and told them he thought he'd better drive home with some relatives who had turned up. Actually, he just wanted to stay behind a while. It was a beautiful blue and white summer day. The tidy suburban cemetery had caught his fancy, and now he felt like a quiet stroll. Ernie followed his little impulses these days. As he sometimes said, I figure I've got plenty of time. I just don't feel the pressure like I used to. The last car chugged away. Ernie stretched and started to stroll slowly, but not like an old man, now that he was alone. His hair had grown whiter in the last few years and his face a little wrinkled, but that was due to the very judicious use of silvering and theatrical liner. People's comments about his youthfulness had gotten wearisome and would, he knew, eventually become suspicious. Keeping himself oriented by a white tower at the cemetery gate, he arrived at an area that had no graves as yet, no trees either, just lawn. He made his way to the center of it where there was a gently swelling hummock and sat down in the warm, crinkly grass, resting his back against the slope. The sky was lovely, enough clouds to be interesting, but a great oval of pure blue just overhead, a pear-shaped gateway to space. He felt no grief at his sister's death, only the desire to think a bit, have a quiet look at his past, and another at the great future. Alone like this, he dared to face his fate for a moment and admit to himself that, all wishful thinking aside, it really began to look as if he were going to live forever, or at least for a very long time. Live forever? That was a phrase to give you a chill, he told himself. And what to do, he asked himself, with all that time? Back in the strange weeks, he'd have had little trouble in answering that question. If only he had known then what he did now and realized what was being offered to him. For, during his sober decades, Ernie had gradually come to a shrewdly accurate estimate of what had happened to him then. He thought of it in terms of having been offered six gifts and turned down five of them. Back in the strange weeks, and armed with the five rejected gifts, page at a glance and mind reading were the only ones that counted, though, he could easily have said, live forever by all means. Increase your knowledge and understanding until your mind bursts or is transfigured. Plunge forever into the unending variety of the cosmos. Open yourself to everything. But now, equipped to travel only as a snail, still, even snails get somewhere. With forever to work with, even four words at a glance gets you through many, many books. Patient love and dispassionate thought give you human insight in the end, can finally open the tightest shutter on the darkest human heart. But that would take so very long, and Ernie felt tired. Not old, just tired. Tired. Best to simply watch the soft clouds. The pear-shaped gateway had become almost circular. To do anything but drift through life, a stereotype among stereotypes was simply... Too much work. At that very moment, as if his thought had summoned the experience into being, another scene filmed over the blue sky and white clouds above him. A sudden humming in his ears, a kind of audible silence, informed him that his second sight was at work, warning him of some deadly danger. But this was a more gentle instance of it, for not all his consciousness jumped somewhere else. All through the experience, he was still aware of himself leaning against the grassy hummock, of the restful melancholy of the scene around him, and of the sky overhead. The second scene only superimposed itself on the first. He was poised many hundreds of miles above the earth, a ghost Ernie immune to the airlessness and the sun's untempered beams. At his back was black night filled with stars. Below him stretched the granulated dry brown of Earth's surface, tinged here and there with green, clumped with white cloud, and everywhere faintly hazed with blue. Up there in space with him, right at his elbow, 
so close that he could reach out and touch it, was a tiny silver cylinder about as big as a hazelnut, domed at one end, reflecting sunlight from one point in a way that would have been blinding enough, except that Ernie's ghost eyes were immune to brightness. As he reached out to examine it, the thing darted away from him as if at some imperious summons, like a bit of iron jumping through a magnetic field. But in spite of its enormous acceleration, Ernie's ghost was able to follow it in its downward plunge. It kept just ahead of his outstretched fingertips. The brown granules that were Earth's surface grew in size. The tiny metal cylinder began to glow with more than reflected sunlight. It turned red, orange, yellow, and then blazing white as atmospheric friction transformed it into a meteor. Ernie's ghost immune to friction and incandescence alike, followed it as it dove toward its target. For even though Ernie had never heard of a juxtaposer and how it brought objects together, he had the feeling from the dizzying speed of the meteor's plunge that it yearned for something. He knew that most meteors vaporized or exploded, but this did not, even when the Earth's brown surface grew rivers and roads. Suddenly there was a cloud bank ahead. Then, in the white, there appeared an almost circular hole toward the very center of which the meteor plunged. Everything was happening very fast now, but his ghost senses were able to keep pace. As they plunged through the cloud ring and the green landscape below grew explosively, he saw the white tower, the trees, the curving drives, and the clearing which was now the target. There was still time to escape. Lying on the warm grass, with death lancing down from the sky at miles a second, he had merely to roll over. But it was simply too much work. Elsewhere near Earth, a recorder sped toward Galaxy Center, a message which ended, Six gifts tendered, all finally refused. I will now sign off and await pickup with one juxtaposer. A little later, a receiver in Galaxy Center passed the message to a central recorder, which filed it in the Star Swarm 37 section with this addition. Spiritual immaturity of Terran bipeds indicated. Advise against enlightenment and admission to galactic citizenship. Test subject humanely released. Police digging into the turf under... Ernie's shattered head two days later found the bright bullet, cold now, of course, and untarnished. Looks like silver, one cop said, scratching his head. Haven't I heard somewhere that the Mafia used silver bullets? So bright, though. Lieutenant Padilla, later on, lifting the bullet in his forceps to re-examine it for rifling marks, had the same thought about its brightness. By now, however, he knew it was not silver, what alloy was never satisfactorily determined. Actually, it was made of the same substance as the everlasting razor blade. This time, although he still found no rifling marks, a tiny dull stretch on the flat end of the cylinder caught his attention. He took up a magnifier and examined it carefully. A moment later, he put down the magnifier, snatched up the pocketbook found on the dead man and rechecked some cards in it. The bullet dropped from the forceps, rolled a few inches. The lieutenant sat back in his chair, breathing a little hard. This is one for the books, all right, he told himself. I've heard a lot of people, soldiers especially, talk about such bullets. But I never expected to see one. For under the magnifying glass, finely engraved in very tiny letters, he had read the words, Ernest, Wenceslaw Meeker. End of section four. End of Bullet with His Name by Fritz Leiber. Read by Paul Hampton.